All right, let's see. Sorry, guys, I um, let me spend a few seconds to make sure that the live chat is on. Okay, test one, two, three. Uh, seems to be working. If you guys are alive, uh, could you could some of you type something just so that I see you? Well, well, let's see. Maybe some of you will show up later. And now let's go to the lectures. Yeah, if you are having trouble viewing or have uh, using a live chat, just let me know. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and start. Um, we just finished quiz number three, in which I ask um, you to compare packet switching and uh, circuit switching. Um, I think two of the teams actually answered the quiz already. Uh, in the end, it seems that um, uh, they all feel that it really depends on the scenario, depends on the traffic source load, and so on and so forth. Well, the conclusion seems to be quite consistent. Uh, it depends. And packet switching or circuit switching, none of them is uh, an absolute winner. So for example, packet switching is great for bursty data because it seems to utilize resource better. But uh, on the other hand, uh, packets can come along in real fast speed, so we could have congestion. Packet switching network sounds easier, right? Because uh, it seems simpler and there's no call set up. But for applications like these, if we will be streaming voice, streaming video, it's actually nice to have some sort of guarantee of the bandwidth. Therefore, the user experience will be better. So good and bad, right? Now, in order to support such that uh, we can handle excess congestion, uh, in packet network on internet, we need to have these extra mechanisms uh, to support such that we can accom accommodate packet loss and we have congestion control so that we can also um, make sure that the delay is under control. Now to guarantee bandwidth for audio video applications that, remain, um, that remains a very hard problem. Uh, in chapter nine, which we'll, we won't have uh, time to cover this semester, but if you are interested, go dig in. It's uh, a chapter called Multimedia Networking. All right, so let me conclude the comparison between packet switching and circuit switching with this. Can you come up with a human analogy that works somewhat like circuit switching where we reserve resources and dedicate that to users versus uh, packet switching, um, the users are actually served more on de demand. If you know of any, if you can think of any, uh, you know, write a comment below the video. Now, let's you know, switch gear a little bit back to store and forward. Okay, so if you recall, there was an example, but we have only two hubs in that example. Let's extend that to three hubs. What I'm trying to show here is um, for this packet here, this large L bits uh, going on a link with transmission rate R, uh, the transmission time will be L over R seconds, right? And on packet switching network, a packet must arrive at the router entirely before it can be forwarded on further. Okay, so this is again called the store and forward. Therefore, to travel three hops, uh, the total delay will be three times L over R. Now, use this configuration. Let's say the packet size is 7.5 megabits and the bandwidth was uh, 1.5 megabits per second. Then the one hop delay will be 7.5 over 1.5, that's five seconds. So three hops, uh, we'll need 15 seconds. So this packet L here will need 15 seconds to traverse this network. Good. So keep that scenario in mind. Let's try to do this. 
Let's break that big packet L into smaller L's, smaller packets. Break uh, them exactly to 5,000 smaller packets, let's say. Then each packet is only this big, 1.5k uh, bits. Therefore, to transmit each small packet, it takes only one thousandth of a second. So it would look more like this. At the source, uh, small packet number one spends one millisecond to transmit, and then another, and then another, and finally three milliseconds, packet number one arrives at the destination. Now what's nice about cutting the big packet into smaller one is this. When router one is transmitting packet one, source here finished already transmitting packet one, so it can start transmitting packet two. And similarly, router one here transmit packet one, router, uh, sorry, router two here transmit packet one. Router one finish transmitting packet one can begin transmit packet two. And the source, now idle, can begin transmit packet three. So you see, the packets are all pipelined, uh, streamlined. In the end, three milliseconds for packet one to arrive, but you just need 4,999 milliseconds more to finish transmitting the entire sets of uh, 5,000 packets. And the delay is reduced from 15 seconds that we have calculated previously to 5.002 seconds. So let me illustrate. Um, previously, big packet, 5,000, uh, smaller packets together bunched up. It takes five seconds or 5,000 milliseconds to transmit to the next hub. At the next hop there, the packet switch over here uh, needs to wait until receiving the entire packet before forwarding, store, and forward. So to transmit to the second hop, uh, there's another five seconds. So unlike if we streamline uh, the smaller packets like this, delay is only 5,000 and two microseconds. Nice. Now this technique, it's called the message segmentation. And this is why the internet packets tend to be smaller than the uh, big messages that usually application uh, generates. Right. Now we again switch gear a little bit and focus on the functionalities that the internet core needs to implement. Okay. First is called routing. We have these routing algorithms implemented. Okay, um, there are several of them. We'll be learning them uh, in, I think, chapter five. Okay, what they do is to calculate from a source to a destination. In fact, all the source destination pairs that's possible on the internet. What is the best path? Okay, for the packet to travel. Now, after that uh, calculation is done. A forwarding table like this will be installed inside the router. What it says is this, uh, for destination 0100, the best way, the best path suggests that the outgoing link should be interface 3 or link 3, and so on and so forth. So this table could be quite extensive depending on how many destinations there are. Now this table serves the second very important function called the forwarding. It's primarily to pa move packets uh, from one input to uh, the output. So it happens right here. Uh, what I'm drawing here is a packet arriving at this router. Okay. And inside the packet header, it says the destination of the packet is 0111. The router here uh, will go to the forwarding table and try to look up. All right, header destination value, and try to find a match. Let's see, yeah, this is the uh, matching entry. And uh, according to the forwarding table, we should pass it on to output link two. So that's why you see uh, an error pointing uh, through output link two. 
So that was the forwarding function. It sounds quite easy, the forwarding function, but if you think of this router being one of the big routers in the backbone, there could be millions and billions of packets coming in every minute. So a short delay, but millions of them, billions of them accumulate. Uh, the forwarding delay and the load of the router here can be really high. All right, that's why we say forwarding is an important function, although it's very simple. Good. Again, forwarding, very important. We'll see a little bit more of routing and forwarding in chapter five, I just mentioned. Good. To sum up a bit, data network, also called datagram network or packet network. Now the datagram here is uh, to contrast to telegrams that we used to send um, maybe 50, 60 years ago in the telephone network. In there, it's using telephone network to send short messages, so we say telegram. Now we're using the data network, the packet network, to send short messages, therefore datagram. So datagram network here, although a new term, but what it meant is the same thing, a packet network, or simply a data network. What's important is in the packet header, the destination address would tell you or tell the router what to do. And so the router finds out, uh, finds out what is the next hub. Okay. But you see, uh, packets are forward one at a time. The forwarding table could change in the middle of uh, you know, passing the packets around, even though they're going to the same destination. Because the routing algorithm could be triggered to run suddenly the next moment. So analogy is this, if we all gather on NTU campus and try to go to 101 together, for example, we could call Uber or just call these taxi cabs. The drivers, I'm pretty sure they are gonna you know, take different ways. Okay, so this describes a little bit the behavior of these packets traveling the internet. Well, as you heard earlier, sometimes, for example, sending audio or video streams, we will really like circuit-like behavior. One can potentially implement such a behavior using this technique, virtual circuit. Uh, what it implements is this, you know, all these packets belonging to the same stream, that's assigned a tag. It's a special number, a special ID. So the routers along the way that is already being set up at the beginning, will maintain these per circuit or per call state, uh, which actually records what the ID is. Therefore, packet that, packets can then traverse the same way consistently. Usually, uh, packets traveling the same way, the delay is more predict predictable, and that is the property that these multimedia streams desire. Good. Now, to sum up uh, Internet Core, the packet switching, circuit switching to CAMs. So we are all under uh, this big umbrella, mm. Telecommunic uh, telecommunication networks, it's a big term. So the circuit uh, switching network CAM is here, packet switching network CAM is over the other way. Now under circuit switch network, uh, we could see that there are different ways of dividing the bandwidth, dividing the resource. Uh, one is to do it frequency dimension, at the di frequency dimension. The other is to do it at the time dimension, right? And some of these circuit switch networks could be using a combination of them, all right? In packet switch network, mostly we do datagram. Uh, send packets out put the destination link to the packet header, and hopefully the routers will be knowing what's the right thing to do. And uh, hopefully the packets reach the destination. Now, if we wanna have a bit more guarantee, uh, then that's set up virtual circuits. So that's the idea. Uh, these days on the internet, we're able to implement both virtual circuit as well as datagram. So you see packet switch network, it's not strictly datagram, it's not strictly virtual circuit, it's also possible to implement a hybrid of these. Good, now we move to the next topic. And today I'm gonna be using a, a, a special streamer te technique and see if I can do the transition well. Okay, so. 
internet structure. It's a network of networks. Earlier we learned we have n systems at the edge of the internet. They're connected to the core through the access networks, which are part of these uh, access ISPs. Now, some of these ISPs serve home users more. They are called the residential ISPs. Uh, others serve companies and universities. They are more often being called institutions and ISPs. Well, either way, uh, any two hosts in these ISPs wanting to send packets to each other, their access ISPs will need to be interconnected. As a result, we see a network of access networks. Over time, they grow pretty large and complex. And much of these growth is driven by the economics and some of it driven by governmental or business policies. In the next few slides, what you will be seeing is essentially the evolution of the internet. What I'm drawing here is a bunch of these access ISPs, uh, or I call access nets here on this figure. Let me just omit drawing the end systems because they're just going to be too much of them and uh, the picture gets too messy. So the first thing uh, the internet engineers are thinking is this, how are we going to interconnect these guys? Well, one obvious way is, how about connecting them all? But as a result, you see there are n square connections. And when the internet grow, adding one more access net, you will need to add n extra links. So this is going to be a very expensive thing to maintain. And so internet engineers go with the other extreme. Everyone connects to one global ISP in the middle. So data come here and the global ISP transit the data for the access net to the destination. Similarly, here, here. So in a way, the global ISP in the middle here is providing transit services to the access nets, which are the customers. Now, as the internet grow, as the number of these access nets grow, then there'll be more paying for the transit services. Gradually, the global ISP will begin to see profit. And when business is profitable, you see competitors. So now we have not just one global ISP, but multiple global ISPs. So A, B, C here are three global ISPs. They're competitors, but unfortunately they also need to collaborate. Because what? Just like the access nets needs to be interconnected so that they can serve the end systems, their customers. ISP A, B, C will also need to interconnect so that they serve their customers, the access nets. All right, so must interconnect. There are two ways for the uh, global ISPs to interconnect. First is to establish peering links among each other. The other is to connect through these IXPs, Internet Exchange Points. Now these IXPs are special. They're typically set up by government fund or by the nonprofit organizations uh, because it's kind of important that we have these, you know, third um, company there maintaining the basic operation of the internet to avoid companies, commercial companies, uh, to dominate. So that's pretty much uh, the structure of the internet for a long time. But over time, we see more. So local communities such as this guy and this guy here can also grow. When there is enough number of these XN nets around, 
we begin to see regional ISPs showed up. What these regional ISP is doing is this. Offering lower price internet access to the access nets. And try to negotiate uh, internet access with the global ISP uh, with a lower price. So hopefully the regional net here finds uh, a margin of profit. So profit here and saving money here. For global ISP, this might not be a bad thing at all because it only needs to deal with one customer, which is the regional ISP, instead of multiple of them. Okay. So uh, less overhead. And this structure has been there for a long time until about a decade ago. Content provider networks showed up. Um, let me talk about content provider network by example. So let me use Google here. It will be easier for you to understand. So Google established these data centers worldwide. Okay. What they do is to go to access networks uh -huh, locally where the data centers are and then ask to connect to the access network, uh, their data center. Now, the number of machines they are maintaining there at their data center and the connections they are buying from the local ISP are actually comparable to the global ISP here. Uh, the entire infrastructure there at the content provider network uh, is just as big as the global ISPs in the middle. But what's a bit odd is this. Hmm. The content provider networks, they are actually physically at the lower level of the hierarchy. As opposed to the global ISPs, they are at the center of the hierarchy. Scale comparable, but where they are in the hierarchy, very different. All right. In the next picture, let me try to draw the network slightly differently so that uh, uh, you see uh, where they are in terms of how resourceful uh, these provider networks are. You see here then the most resourceful one at the top, the least resourceful one at the bottom. So at the center, we have tier one ISP and content provider network. Tier 1 ISP interconnect to each other through peering link, and they also connect to the IXPs. Content provider network somewhat different. They connect to the local access ISPs and IXP. All right. But keep in mind, this is not exactly uh, absolute. Some tier one ISPs might also have uh, access ISPs uh, connections. Google here, mm, if this tier one ISP offers a fair price, might also establish a connection. All right, good. Now the final slide is just to give you a rough idea uh, what's inside a tier one ISP. As I'm drawing here, it looks simple, but it's actually quite complicated. This is a Sprint's um, backbone. Sprint is one of the major operators in the US. It's also a tier one ISP. Each of these red dot is called an I, uh, is called a POP, POP, point of presence. So the row there is pretty much like a data center in Google. Um, it's a rack of machines, uh, in this case, a rack of routers. Okay, so rack of these routers. They're interconnected between each other, and they're also offering connections to the customers. And some of them might be connected to other tier one ISPs. And these links are to go further up uh, into the backbone, in the hierarchy of the backbone uh, in Sprint's uh, network.
And this is internet structure, a network of networks. And now we switch back live uh, to the slides. So we've uh, finished talking about uh, internet core. Next is the delay loss and the other performance metrics that we see often in a packet switch network. So these things are very important to introduce here in chapter one, because we're going to mention them again and again in the future. Uh, same for 1.5 and 1.6. Well, actually 1.6 that much, not that much. Well, let's focus on 1.4 now. Now, before we talk about how uh, loss and delay uh, can be long or short and how we measure them, let's uh, find out first, why do we have loss and delay? And this is why. Uh, we have packets coming in to the router, all right? If the arrival rate there exceeds uh, the output link rate, so if input rate exceeds outgoing rate, then the packets will have to queue up here, here at the queue, all right? So we have delay here transmitting a packet. We have delay also here, oops, waiting uh, for its turn to go out and see here if a packet arrives when the queue over here is full uh, then we have packet drops packet loss and this is where delay and loss occur mainly mm, in the router when the router capacity is not as good as the output uh, yeah when the uh, network when the router's capacity here storing the packet is not as good, then we'll have trouble. Uh, long delay and uh, packet loss. Again, uh, let me play the video so that uh, I can actually check on the live chat. Internet structure. It's a network of networks. Oopsie, sorry. Yeah, it's not working this time. Um, yeah, so this is the video I want to play. It's on now. Now, packet delay. There are four components. The first component is the nodal processing delay, but we just call it processing delay. It occurs right here when the packet arrives at the router. Router here checks the bit errors in case there's any and decides quickly which output link the packet should go out. Next, queuing delay. That's the time the packet waits until it's turn to go out on the output link. It occurs right here at the buffer space where packet queued up. But the amount of weight depends on the congestion level of the router. Component three is the transmission delay, and it's calculated this way. R being the link bandwidth, L being the packet length. And the time to transmit the packet out will be L divided by R. And it's happening right here at the interface between the router and the link. Final component, propagation delay. Provided the length of the physical link and the propagation speed of signals traveling the physical link. We know that the propagation delay is D divided by S. So essentially the time for the packet to traverse the physical link. Be careful, S here is the distance the signal can travel per second. R here is the number of bits the transmitter can push out per second. Although I call S the propagation speed, R the link speed sometimes. But there are two very different quantities. Right? Now let's go through a couple examples to exercise calculating transmission delay and propagation delay. 
What you're seeing here is a caravan of 10 cars. Now the way to think of this scenario is this. Uh, think of cars being bits and caravans being a packet. So we have a packet containing 10 bits in a sense. The cars will be propagating at the speed of 100 kilometers per hour over 100 kilometer reaching the second booth. Toe booth number one here takes 12 seconds to service a car. All right. Question here is asking how long until the packet is lined up before the second router. All right, so transmission speed, well, transmission delay plus the propagation delay. So what is the transmission delay? We have uh, 12 seconds serving per bit, and then there are 10 bits. So the time to push the entire caravan out of the tow booth is two minutes. And then the propagation delay is for the car to travel 100 kilometer. So 100 kilometer dividing the propagation speed. So we have 60 minutes here. And so altogether, 62 minutes before the entire caravan to reach the second tow booth. So you see, in this case, transmission speed, very fast. Propagation speed, slow. In the second example, the configuration is uh, slightly different, mainly propagation speed and transmission speed. Propagation speed now goes really fast, but transmission speed much slower. So question here is asking, will the first car arrive at the second tow booth before all the cars are being serviced? Let's see. Uh, when will the first car arrive at the second tow booth? So transmission delay, one minute. Propagation delay, so we have a hundred kilometer, uh, but we're traveling a thousand kilometers, so we'll be spending one tenth of an hour propagating, and that's six minutes. Together, seven minutes. So the first car will spend seven minutes before arriving at the second tow booth. Now, seven minutes is also the time to service seven cars for this first tow booth. That means we have three cars uh, that are still behind at the first tow booth. So yes, okay. When the first bit arrive at the next router, there could still be bits not yet transmitted out from the previous router. So in this case where the propagation speed is really fast, transmission uh, rate very low, uh, you had this weird situation. Good, uh, let's sum up packet delay. So there are four components, pro processing delay, queuing delay, transmission delay, and propagation delay. Transmission delay, very low. Typically, microseconds, uh, we just, you know, ignore the processing delay when we calculate packet delay. Transmission delay, propagation delay, very easy to calculate. L divided by R, this quantity is often significant and especially the case for low speed links. Propagation delay, slightly harder. It varies quite a bit from microseconds to hundreds of milliseconds. So this extreme is for uh, satellite links, for example. Uh, we've seen earlier, it could go up to 200 or even more milliseconds. Sometimes the transatlantic or trans-Pacific links, very long optic fibers could also take up to 100 milliseconds. Now, in the process of calculating packet delay, the hardest component is this queuing delay. Now, it's very hard to calculate accurately because it depends on the congestion level at the router. Just to give you a sip of how hard it is, let's define again, R being the link bandwidth, L being the packet size. Let's add one more variable, the average arrival rate. So, L multiply A is the average 
speed arrival rate. That is also the incoming traffic rate. R is the outgoing traffic rate. So we could define traffic intensity being L A divided by R. So when that quantity is close to zero, that means incoming rate very low, outgoing rate very high. Then no bits really need to wait. So queuing delay very small. And it's depicted here. When L A divided by R is very small, queuing delay also very small. The other extreme is here. When the intensity is greater than one, that means there are more bits coming in than more bits going out. And when time goes on and on and on, uh, the newly arrival bits will need to wait longer and longer and longer. Uh, and it's pretty much here, uh, approaching infinity. Now, when the intensity is between very small to one, uh, delay is simply growing. And as we will be reaching, approaching infinity, you see that the curve grows quickly like that. Okay, close to an exponential trend. So hard to estimate queuing delay. In fact, it takes a whole semester for a professor to teach about how one calculates queuing delay. And at the graduate uh, school, there's advanced queuing delay that one can also take to make sure that you do a better job. Okay, estimating queuing delay for highly dynamic incoming traffic. All right. So that was the theory part of the packet delay. One can also find out what is the real internet packet delay by uh, trying out this program, trace route. Okay. What it does is to measure delay from a source one hop at a time all the way to a destination. So this is what I'm drawing here, source to destination. And it's sending three packets one at a time uh, to reach each of the routers along the way. So router there receiving such a packet would return by sending a reply back to the sender. Now the sender there can time the interval between the transmission and receiving the reply and gets one estimation of the round trip time between the sender to the router. So it works like this, three probes to the first router three round trip time estimation, three probes to the second router, three round trip time estimations to the second router. And this goes on and on until it reaches uh, the final destination. And then the trace route program stops. The output of the program looks like this. This is an example trace routing from Gaia, UMass.edu to Oracom France. So this is saying first hub router's name is cs-gw at IP address 128.something.something.something. And there are three round trip time estimations, one and one and two milliseconds respectively. What's a little bit interesting is between hub seven and eight. There. You see at hop seven, round trip time was about 22 milliseconds, but suddenly to hop A, the delay is about 100 milliseconds. So that is the transatlantic links connecting from US to Europe. Uh, a little bit more interesting is also hop 17 and 18. You see star, star, stars. That means the routers are not responding. Okay, And it could be because the probing messages are lost or the replying messages are lost. But it's more likely that the router is turned off replying to these. Uh, I mean, routers are on, but the routers turn off replying these probing messages. Well, well let's try, um, you know, sending a trace route ourselves from here. How about that? Let's go over to a terminal and then trace route. 
to say, say Google. How about that? All right. Good. First hub router. Well, it didn't tell me the name of the router, so chances high that the router doesn't have a name. Okay. Delay reasonable. 10 millisecond, 3 millisecond, and another 3 millisecond. Router 2 here, well, either the probing messages are lost or uh, router turns off the functionality of returning to trace route probes. Now, third hop, ooh, 30 milliseconds, suddenly much higher. Uh, okay, fifth hop, uh, delay not much higher than the third hop. And you see here, uh, when it's star, 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 it takes longer time. It's because uh, when the traceroute program sends the probing packet, there's a timeout interval. Traceroute will wait until the time exceeds the interval. Then it determines that, hey, the router is probably not going to respawn anymore. So forget about the first probe, send the next probe. Next probe waits also some amount of time, timeout give up and then sends the third probe. Okay, good. Finally, we reached www.google.com. But the name is actually quite different. TSA something something. Hmm, interesting. And the end-to-end -end delay, end-to-end -end round trip delay to www.google.com is about 20 something milliseconds. Now, something that's very odd is here, hop eight. Uh, if you look closer, we do have three round trip time estimates, but each time number A here along the way, the eighth hop is slightly different. IP address is 101, 49, and 97. So you see here, packets, although going to the same destination, coming from the same source, as they go on the internet, um, the routes could, could actually change. Also, you see, hey, the time it takes to reach hop 5, 30 milliseconds, but the time it takes to reach hop 12 is only 20 something seconds. So uh, the load of the internet changes also over time. So sometimes when you are probing to a closer router, could take a longer time because it was busier there. But when the traffic load drops and when you're probing a router that are far farther away, you could get a shorter round trip delay. Yeah, very curious. And uh, let's go back to the slide. And it turned out that it's a good time to start the next quiz.
Hey guys, sorry. Uh huh. So should I replay that segment of video so that you guys hear about it? I think it's better that way. Uh, sorry about my the OBS skill. I was just bragging about it, but it, ouch. Now, uh, let's replay that. Packet delay. Well, it's not transiting. Oh, I know why. All right, let me just go over the quiz again. Very good to know, thank you. Whew. Um, yep. Are we back online? Uh, it looks so, so let me go over the quiz again. And probably I'll just stay on the slime mode and not playing more tricks just so that I don't crash the OBS again. So this is quiz four. Okay, what I'm showing here is the output of the trace route example there in the slide uh, from Gaia to Oricon, friends. So what I'm asking you to do is to look a bit closer into the output and answer these three questions. First, how come the three delay measurements not, are not quite the same? So you see here, 21, 18, 18, 16, 11, 13. Why do you think they are not quite the same? And how come some delay measurements to hop 10 are longer than those to hop 11? Hey, Hop 10 should be closer to the source, hop 11 farther, but the delay to hop 10 is longer than the delay that's farther. Can you think of reasons uh, that uh, explains this weird phenomenon? Now the weirdest is this, try estimate the delay between hop 3 and hop 4. So there's the link between hop 3 and hop 4. What do you think? Uh, the delay of that link is. And also, try to estimate the delay for the link between hop 8 and hop 9. So hop 8 and 9 over here, delay is over here. So tell me how you estimate the delay and why you estimate the delay that way. Tell me also, can you estimate delay for a pair of hops delay and uh, why you don't think that uh, it's reasonable to estimate uh, a delay reliably with the data here. So that's quiz four. Think about it. And let's move back to the lecture. Good, so we were just uh, finished talking about packet delay. Um, so the, um, it happens everywhere, pretty much around the routers and the link. Um, the next, let's talk about packet loss. So it happens here. Okay, when the queue is uh, close to full. Okay, and when the packet arrives uh, into a full queue, then we see packet losses. So when packet loss occur. Uh, usually transmissions will be needed in order to cover for the loss. Now it can be done by the previous router, it can also be done by the uh, source and system, 
Well, some services, uh, some applications might just, you know, say, forget about it. Let's move on, okay, and go on without recovering for the loss. Okay. So packet loss, easy. Next is uh, throughput. This is yet another metric that uh, allow people to judge whether a service is actually better than the other. Uh, what it meant is this. Uh, the rate at which the bits are transferred between the sender and the receiver. So this is the effective receiving rate at the receiver. Okay. So maybe the router is retransmitting, retransmitting again and again and again. There is a lot of effort, but they could all well be dropped somewhere in the middle here. So what's really important from the user's perspective is, hey, how much I'm receiving? Okay. Uh, from a server's point of view, a service provider's point of view, content provider's point of view, uh, what they care is also how much I'm able to send out effectively. Right? So that is called the throughput. Now, what measures throughput um, depending on the time scale we're looking at it? So the throughput at the, any given point in time is called the instantaneous throughput. Uh, the throughput that we measure over a long time and then taking an average of that is the average throughput. Okay. On the internet, instantaneous throughput doesn't really mean all that much because it's very dynamic. So what we care more okay, as a user, as a service provider, is the average throughput. Good. Now let's focus back down to the, uh, this picture below. So this is uh, the server sending out files or sending out a video stream of size f okay and they could be going through multiple links until it reaches the receiver so let's say that this link here close to the server uh, runs at rs bits per second and this other link here closer to the client runs at rc bits per second so depending on how big the value RS is uh, the pipe, okay? If you think of it as like transmitting water over water pipelines, uh, then it could be smaller or bigger. So in this case, you're seeing RS seems to be sm smaller and RC here bigger. And again, um, the database here or the hard disk here uh, is essentially like a big water bucket uh, dumping out water onto the internet. Now, how do you estimate the throughput uh, between a pair of source and destination? This is what you look at. Let's, uh, let's consider the scenario where RS is smaller than RC. What do you think uh, the average end-to-end -end throughput should be? Yeah, you're probably thinking, hey, obviously, uh, based on your life experience, pumping water out to water pipeline, it will be actually restricted by the smaller pipe, right? So RS being smaller, the average end-to-end -end throughput will be RS. Uh, the other extreme, when RS is bigger than RC, what will be the average end-to-end -end throughput? Yeah, uh, the narrow pipe again, uh, and this time it will be RC. And there's actually a term for these narrower pipe along the entire way. It's called the bottleneck link. Okay. So link on the end-to-end -end, uh, pipe that constrains the end-to-end -end throughput. Now, let's look at the picture that looks more like how data are transmitting end-to-end -end on the internet. So we have end systems. Some of them are servers. We have end systems. Some of them are clients. So links next to the servers are RS links. Uh, links close to the clients runs at RC. Now, at the core of the internet, uh, we have these big pipes, huge pipes, okay, with transmission rate R, so really large. But see, if we have 10 of these end-to-end pairs, then uh, the throughput is actually bounded by the minimum of RC, RS, and this time we see uh, R divided by 10, okay. 
so again, uh, find out which one is the bottleneck uh, along the entire end-to-end -end path. In practice, uh, uh, most of the measurement studies actually find that the bottleneck are mostly RS and RC. Okay. Uh, the core of the internet usually have abundant uh, network bandwidth. So that was throughput, and that concludes 1.5 delay and loss and throughput in packet switch networks. We'll be switching gear and talking about a subject that's really not that technical. It's called the protocol layers, aka the service model. So, so far we have heard about all these new terms. Hosts, routers, links, access media, applications, protocols. Um, protocols are essentially the software side of uh, the internet and these end systems and routers they are the harder side of the internet all right so if I talk about talk about these terms randomly without the structure I'm pretty sure that it's actually very hard for you to memorize uh, it's also hard to allow you to give you a good structural view of what the internet is so what we often think about it as engineers is also how we communicate Okay, so question here to answer is, is there any hope of organizing all these seemingly random pieces and so that uh, it's easier to discuss? Okay, so hey, internet engineers also discuss with each other. Having these terms well-defined and having a structure of it uh, helps. Now, before I talk about how we organize these pieces uh, for the internet, let me give you an analogy. Let's talk about the organization of another network, the air travel network. Okay. So if you now try to recall traveling to a foreign country, what do you do first? Well, you Google and find if there's a cheap fly to the destination, isn't it? So first thing you do is to purchase a ticket. Good. Next is you wait until the date of the travel. Uh, you go to the airport. And first, by checking in your luggage. So as a result, you get this uh, clam ticket, and you also get the boarding pass. And with the boarding pass, you approach the gate, and the staff members there will try to, you know, uh, allow passengers to go on the plane one by one. So they load passengers through the gates. And then when everyone is seated, uh, the pilot will say, hey, welcome, and we're about to take off. Please buckle up, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, the plane is bust off and take off. Now, most of the time you spend on air travel is these. Uh, airplane being routed from one region to another region. By, uh, the pilots are busy communicating with the control centers per region. Now you sit comfortably, enjoy the onboard meal. Uh, hopefully the flight is enjoyable as um, sometimes the onboard meal is not exactly that good. But anyway, in the end, a miserable, um, a misery will stop at some time. And then uh, the plane lands. After arriving at the gate, uh, you guys are left off, okay, the plane. And then you claim your baggage bag using the claim ticket. And if the baggage is not there, then hey, you report to the baggage service and you know show them the claim. And they will try to look up in the system and see where your bag is. Okay. Now, if the meal is really bad, then you might complain by calling the ticket office and saying that, hey, you, need, you guys need to improve on the onboard meal. So yeah, very lengthy discussion here. A uh, series of steps, okay? Um, it's actually a bit hard to track back, but, but if you capture this, so what I'm doing here is to, you know, allow you to relay uh, services, pieces of terms easier by laying them layers by layers. So, so a series of steps, uh, seemingly not well connected, but can actually have an implicit structure behind it like this. Okay. So this is the layer structure of air travel. 
So you see here, ticket, ticket, all right? So the change of implementation within a layer is transparent to the rest of the systems. So a change can go on quickly without affecting too many people, right? I don't know, do you like changes? Usually when I was younger, I liked changes. Uh, it's, it's really the old people who don't like changes. Would you like to guess why the old people don't like changes? Hmm. What I can tell you now is now I'm a bit old. Because old people tend to be busy all the time. Uh, making changes uh, is really troublesome. Okay, um, we get emotionally wary already just to think about it. So that's why all people don't like changes. You see, people, especially busy people, don't like changes. So if you want a system to evolve quickly, smoothly, uh, the principle here is to try to modulate the big system such that a small piece of it uh, can continue to evolve. And hopefully the other small pieces evolve along, okay? And we all progress, okay? And hopefully to a better future, all right? Um, now, the last point is layering harmful. Now, modulating things into smaller pieces and everyone minds their own small piece. Uh, can you think of a bad thing doing things this way? Hmm. Hmm. So one example I can think of is um, there's once I'm flying, uh, I left my smartphone uh, in the, the uh, sea bag pocket. So I actually got off the gate, uh, but right at the baggage claim, I thought about the situation. Oops, I got a call. Hmm. Hey, Leo. Really, the camera has been off? Only the camera is on. Ah, I see. Thank you for letting me know. I neglected uh, to switch to the slide. We will be in charge uh, of doing the data transfer from one end to another. Uh, a special tag is added to it. Just like when we check in a bag, we get the baggage claim. So the baggage claim here or the tag here contains the necessary information for the other end of the transport service to look at. Therefore, the other end will be able to do things appropriately. So the whole thing together, the message and the transport layer header here, H stands for header, and T is transport. So all together is called now a segment. Okay, so it looks like a packet, just slightly larger than the packet at the application layer. Now we give, uh, we transmit that further down through the operating system to the network layer. And here, again, in order for the network layers between the entities to communicate, we add yet another header, the network header. And all together here, uh, we call, sorry, hit the wrong key. Only mm, the remaining part, uh, which is what? A datagram being passed up to the network layer. Similarly, the network layer looks at the network header and take actions correspondingly. And this will go on so as the packet gets forwarded out. So there is a datagram here. And adding the link layer header for this particular link here, and the packet gets transmitted out and reaching the destination. Link layer extracts the link layer header, pass only the datagram to the network layer. And the network layer grabs the network layer header, pass only a segment up the transport layer. Transport layer header. A header being extracted and the message finally reaches the other end okay, at the application layer. So you see the process of the original message being encapsulated 
in a segment being encapsulated in a datagram, encapsulated into a frame. And then at the other end, decapsulated. So this is how uh, internet is able to communicate from one layer to another as the packet traverse the internet. All right, so the notion of encapsulation. Last, 1.6. So this is an entirely different topic. Okay. But because it's uh, very hot these days, so let me just you know go over, okay, especially this part of the hot topic, how the bad guys can attack a computer network. Now this field is really large, and we do have a chapter in the textbook, chapter nine, that talks extensively about these other things. How can we defend from being attacked? And how can we design the internet somehow so that it's immune to some of the attacks? All right. Now, first, let's talk about why we need to worry about computer network security. Well, it's because the internet was actually designed by professors like me. Okay, so we are actually the naivest people in the world. Um, and well, sometimes also the least skilled people in the world. I'm sorry about using the OBS today. I'm trying to improve my uh, streaming, streaming skills, but uh, turned out a disaster because uh, it gets complicated. Um, I sometimes forget to do this and do that. Okay, so just you know, bear with me. Uh, maybe next week I'll try something that's um, more reliable. All right, so let's come back here. Internet was designed by, you know, land professors like me. So we were not actually designing it, assuming that, hey, it's easy broken or easily attacked. Okay. So professors are all loving people, mutually trusting each other, uh, believing that uh, everyone will do good. But you know what? Um, yeah, that's probably not really the best mindset when we are designing systems. But hey, internet was designed in that mindset. So later on, we'll have to do a lot of catch ups, unfortunately. Okay. Um, in the layers that we'll be talking about, you might see also some security considerations showed up. Okay. Good, so let's talk about the attacks possible. There are actually four popular ones. The first and the foremost, the malwares. Okay, and we are all tired of these viruses, uh, Trojan horses or worms, right? Um, yeah, we can avoid them. Viruses and worms, yeah, they're pretty good. Just like the real life viruses, they self-replicate uh, and they infect uh, other parts of the system, all right? But uh, worm is slightly worse than the virus um, because virus will only reproduce when you execute the code that's uh, infected. But worms, ooh, they can actually reproduce themselves without you doing anything. Okay, so they passively reproduce and propagate themselves. Okay, so luckily you don't want any of these worms in you know real life. Um, and yeah. A very popular malware nowadays is this, spyware. So what, um, what they're doing is just you know, sitting in the background, uh, recording your keystrokes, uh, tracking uh, which websites you go to. Um, yeah, many of us don't like that because uh, it kind of reveals who we are really. Okay. And there's always this inner fear of letting people know who we are. Uh, I don't know about you. Professors also have a certain dark side, right? Yeah, malware, it doesn't really destroy the system. It doesn't kill your file, but um, yeah, it does bad things. Oh, there's a particular form of malware that you don't like. It's called the ransomware. Yeah, so these malwares actually record your keystroke, find out your Dropbox uh, password, for example, and then hijack or kidnap your Dropbox files. So they change the password. And boom, the next day you have trouble logging in. And then they send you email, you know what, your file's in my hand. Okay, send me these amount of money or send me these many Bitcoins, then I will provide the password. 
then you can have your files back. So that was ransomware, um, mostly categorized as a spyware. And the last kind of malware, oh, this kind is, you know, comparing to the other kinds, a little bit more innocent. Um, it does not kidnap your files either, but it actually tries to steal your computer resources. So it's sitting somewhere in the background doing some computation, actually also sending probing messages out. Okay. So these are actually using, these uh, spywares are using your computer as a bot to form a botnet. Okay. So these botnets are very often used to pull one of these distributed denial of service attacks, DDoS attacks which bring us nicely to the second form of attack, distributed denial of service attack. Okay. How this attack works is this. The attackers okay, uh, will try to recruit these um, bots. Okay, so identify a target and then recruit the bots. Okay. So the way they recruit the bot uh, the bots is to you know put spywares into some free program so that you download therefore the spywares are up and therefore mm, your computer becomes a bot okay and these bots uh, will issue a request seemingly like the normal users uh, but there are so many of these requests it actually prevents the regular users such as this one the innocent users such as this one to access uh, the target service. And therefore, the target service is having trouble serving the customers. Right? So denial service to the customers they wish to serve. This is very commonly seen these days. The third uh, is called the sniff packet attack. Okay. Uh, this happens only on these broadcast media. Okay. If you use Ethernet or Wi-Fi uh, without encryption, uh, chances high that uh, there could be someone there with a spy malware uh, watching what you're doing as well. Okay. So network that's running in this promiscuous mode can actually read and record all the packets going through the network. For example, B here, mm, sending packets trying to reach a service A. Uh, the packet, uh, destination, source address, as well as the content can all be sniffed by the middleman here, C. This is not good because um, you might be doing some transactions over the internet. Your password to your bank account might be partly in the payload. Okay. So try not to use any Wi-Fi net that is not encrypted. Last, okay, IP spoofing. Now this attack is much harder to pull off. Uh, it actually requires serious hacker skill. So hackers over here, uh, what it does is to try to generate packets such that it carries uh, a source IP address that is not really uh, where the node is. Okay, it's not really the IP address C is assigned for. It's trying to fake such that it's seemingly the message is coming uh, from B. Now there are usually two purposes uh, a hacker at C here uh, pull an attack like this. One is C is trying to do a denial of service attack to A. Okay? And C doesn't want A to catch uh, that quickly. So pretend to be somebody else and therefore A investigate B instead of C. Second purpose, oh, so that could be a part of uh, denial of service, in fact. There was a DNS-based uh, denial of service attack before. So the way it works is this. There are a bunch of these uh, bots uh, issuing DNS requests to A. So A here is a DNS server. So the bots are issuing DNS requests to all the DNS servers around the world. Okay, not necessarily a particular one. And the target of 
the attack is it actually B because all these DNS servers around the world be sending back uh, the DNS reply. But who do they send the reply to? Mm, B here. Uh, because this guy is the one requesting service and A replies to the client B. So all these DNS servers send back reply to B. Ooh, cramping up at B. B gets attacked. B gets denied of services to all these other services out on the internet. All right. So, yeah, that's the fourth attack. Amusing, isn't it? And you know what? That's the end of chapter one. So network security, if you're interested, dig in. Chapter A, there are a lot more that you can find out. So that's sum up uh, introduction chapter one. We've gone through this. So in internet overview, you hear terminologies, uh, end systems, access networks, routers, okay? And you also hear a uh, protocol, which is the mechanism that's allowing communication between these end systems, routers, or access send end systems. Now, a closer look into the internet. So at the edge, uh, we have end systems. They can potentially communicate in client server mode or peer to peer mode. And we also walk through a few of these access network technologies which could be using physical media. At the core of the internet, uh, we have these two big camps, so two philosophies in a sense, packet switching versus circuit switching one can choose from. For internet, uh, we choose packet switching because of all the messages that we are sending tend to be short. Now, circuit switching, however, is not entirely bad. For long streams like voice and video, this might be a good choice. And that's why we have telephone network serving voice calls. Okay. And internet structure, it's a network of networks. Uh, you see a little bit also there, the evolution of the internet. Uh, the three uh, more or less loosely connected topic, performance metrics, how you measure loss, delay, and throughput. The layer reference model. So that is just to establish the layer structure from application, transport network link, and all the way down to physical layer. And you see that the packets are actually, the data are actually traveling layer, one layer down every time. Uh, and then through the network, up and down. So there are these headers being appended, prepended uh, to the data. And that's called the encapsulation. Security, just for your amusement. Hopefully you get the feel of uh, the internet by now. We'll be going into more depths and starting next week. Chapter two, the application layers. Now let me stop here and see what questions you have. And I hope that there's you know, less trouble the second half of the second hour. This, uh, the slide isn't on the screen, sorry. Um, only the camera shows up, ah, sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll see uh, if I can try to make it up and providing a short video uh, that take you through the layered structure. Um, The reference model. Did I use? Um, I think the loss and the uh, throughput part are are the slides for the uh, loss and throughput up showing um, for you. Well, let me know. Okay. Uh, we did not hear the quiz part. Okay, good. So. There are not many more questions. I guess it's a bit chaotic today. Uh, sorry, guys, uh, but uh, please bear with me. If you have any other questions, just post it uh, on the Facebook group. And if you have other suggestions about streaming, 
Just let me know. Perhaps it would be easier if I just stick to the slides and you know forget about making these videos. Or maybe it's better that I make uh, uh make the videos all the way. Um, so that all I need to do is just to worry about uh changing from one small videos to another. Maybe there's less uh, glitches there. Okay, so let me call it a day. Um, yeah, and I'll post a quiz four onto the Facebook. Bye.